A very good afternoon to you, and thank you for coming this afternoon. I'm very grateful to the Prado, who are hosting this event, uh, to the Fundación Amigos de um, uh, uh, the Universidad Complutense for inviting me to speak today. I was due to speak last year, and due to an accident, I couldn't come, and everyone was very understanding about that, which I appreciated, and I was very happy to be able to finally come and join in the event this year. I want to talk to you this afternoon about three paintings that I was lucky enough to work on over the last few years. Um, it is a particular pleasure to talk about these paintings, which I feel very close to, in um, the collection that, for across the world, everyone thinks of when they think of Velázquez. Uh, they're three paintings, uh, very different in concept, very different in uh, condition, very different in status, uh, the function when they were originally painted. They're also not without controversy in terms of attribution. Um, I call the talk different stories because there is both the story of the treatment, uh, the history that has led to certain condition issues now, but there is the story that is uh, wrapped around each object and that we only, when we study and research, we catch glimpse, glimpses of and often leads us on to other questions, new questions that we hadn't thought of when we first began our work. The first painting I want to talk to you about is this um, really magnificent portrait of Philip IV. It belongs to the Frick Collection in New York. Um, those of you who know, know the city will know that the Frick Collection is a jewel box of a collection. It is just down the road from the Metropolitan Museum. It was built up by the uh, millionaire industrialist Henry Clay Frick and contains wonderful paintings, but certainly this picture by Velázquez is one of its uh, gems. It is a painting um, that is an undisputed masterpiece by the artist. It is also very well documented. It was painted in 1644 during the King's military campaign. During the course of the research that took place whilst I was cleaning the painting, I worked closely with uh, a fellow of the uh, Frick collection, Pablo Perez Dos, a Spaniard who um, actually specializes in ecclesiastical preaching. And he was researching this painting and its role, um, its political role when it was painted and made some very interesting discoveries. Um, the, the picture was uh, actually painted at Fraga. Uh, it's often known as the Fraga Philip. Um, uh, the king billeted his forces at Fraga in preparation from, for the siege of Lerida. I hope I'm not mispronouncing that too badly. Um, but it became clear in his research that this was a, a quite a calculated campaign. To play to the, the king and his entire retinue had traveled with the army, and the portrait was painted in an enormous hurry during the summer of 1644 for it to arrive back in Madrid um, to be exhibited at San Martin in Madrid on the 10th of August, which was the feast day of the Catalonian community. And it was very much what we would now call in political terms spin. Um, the king was in a difficult situation. Part of his own territories had uh, rebelled. Um, the French had taken advantage of that. He was taking back his own territory. And we realized that some of the questions we had about this picture, the fact that it celebrates a military victory and yet is incredibly understated. It is not a bombastic portrait. It is not a warmongering portrait. It's, the qualities of the image are so tied in to the role it was to play back in Madrid on August 10th, 1644, when it was displayed under a golden canopy and a sermon was preached, which referred to the king as a magnanimous Mars, a, a strong, mighty father, but who cared for his children. And in a sense, the sermon um, allowed this dubious situation 
of the king taking back his own territory to be turned into an understated triumph. And I think of that very much as typical of Velazquez, understated triumph. The reason I worked on it was because uh, the, the picture was looking um, rather sad for itself. It had last been treated in 1947, and there was a very oxidized varnish, very discolored varnish. And I hope you can see it pooling here, the old discolored varnish pooling in the texture of the paintwork, um, in the texture of the canvas, which disrupted both the colors and the tonality. It was, in the scheme of things, a, a relatively subtle shift, but when we're talking of an artist of the incredible subtlety of Velazquez, that shift, that change, is very disruptive and um, intrusive. You're seeing here the painting during cleaning, and if I just draw a sort of line here, this area is where the discolored varnish is still in place, this is where it has been cleaned away. It is easier to see that in ultraviolet light. The old varnish fluoresces very strongly on the left. And if I go back, you'll be able to see the comparison of um, where the varnish is in place as revealed by the ultraviolet. Here is a detail of the ultraviolet photograph uh, across the arm and sleeve of the king. And if you look where the varnish is in place on the left-hand side, and then I go to a, the same detail in normal light, I think, I hope you will be able to see just how disruptive this discoloration is. Look at the, the really marvelous treatment of this white satin sleeve and how Velazquez uses a brown transparent color to create the shadow. All of that subtlety is lost where it is buried beneath the varnish. The same in the collar. You see the varnish being removed in the collar. And again, these changes and subtleties um, that are in the original painting are obscured by this very this is the painting after cleaning. Um, if only every picture I was to work on was in, within this condition. As you can see, uh, the losses are really just associated with the, the very edges of the composition. There is a, a little um, loss here in the hat, a scratch here and here, but otherwise in marvelous condition. And after restoration, which was not to onerous a task. During one of the pleasures um, when we work on a painting is that you, know, you become very intimate with the picture itself. And the, the, this painting revealed a number of very interesting pentimenti or artist changes. The, probably the most significant was the position of the hat. In fact, the change is partially visible to the naked eye here. But in infrared, it becomes very obvious indeed. Note, it's, note how it's shorter and lower. So this is the original position of the hat, and this is where Velazquez changed it. I think what is interesting is that he, he changes the angle of the hat. Previously, it was much more oblique across his body, in a sense, in a more natural position. And Velazquez has the king move it to a very self-conscious position, parallel to the body, held aloft. Not, not a sort of natural, not a comfortable position. If you try that yourself, you will feel the sort of artificiality of it. But I think this was one of those 
changes in the painting that was not perhaps because the king came for a second sitting and moved. I think it's a calculated change to do with the purpose of the painting. The painting is to create an icon, to create something that will take the place of the physical body of the king at the ceremony in Saint Martin. And it is to speak of kingship, of godly kingship. And so everything I feel in the painting is calculated, is formal. It speaks of nobility. In moving the position of the hat higher, Velasquez obviously had to raise the hand. And here the hand was raised and it overlaps onto the yellow buckskin jerkin, the leather jerkin um, that was part of the sort of military garb of the king. And you can see it overlapping here. It appears slightly lighter. Again, this is more obvious in ultraviolet, I think. Uh, sorry, not in ultraviolet. This is infrared. This is an infrared image. Whoops. Just go back. Whoops. That's, I've gone, jumped ahead. Um, so this is it overlapping onto the previously painted jerkin that comes down here. So this was the, the change in the hat, but there were other changes. Raising the hat to this more conscious position involved raising the king's proper left arm. He also raised the right arm from the position shown in red. He raised that. And also, he made a very significant change to the coat. The coat was originally painted out right to here. And if you look at the left side, you sense the rigidity of the fabric and how the coat probably would have spread out in this way around the body. But what he does in editing it is to create a much more a slender, um, a much more elegant uh, contour to the body of the king. When the painting was shown in, in Madrid, it was met with great acclaim and uh, contemporary writers said that copies began to be made immediately. Here I have two not terribly marvelous uh, images. Um, I hope you'll forgive them. Um, one is a private collection in London. This is a pre-treatment, a pre-cleaning photograph. Um, the other is a painting that is now in the Dulwich Picture Gallery in London. The Dulwich Picture Gallery painting was originally thought to be the original, the Fraga Philip from 1644, until that painting was actually discovered. This picture was in private hands, and when I first saw this photograph, I was very unimpressed. I was more curious to see this one in London. I took a trip to London uh, to see the other two pictures. So here is the Fraga Philip. Here, um, when I got to London, I found they had cleaned. The private owners had had the picture cleaned. And this is the Dulwich picture. I was surprised at the quality of the painting in private hands. I don't believe it's by Velasquez. Everything was formulaic in its treatment. It clearly owed every decision to the original painting. But it, it felt very much a period painting, a, a product of Velasquez's studio. In contrast, the Dulwich Picture Gallery painting, I found a really ugly picture. It's very um, soft, very uh, weak in its modeling. The brush strokes are fused together. They, they, they have a, um, a lack of purpose that is alien to Velasquez or his studio. Here is a de detail of um, uh, the golden fleece, the Toison d'Or, that Philip wears. And you can see again, I think, the difference in quality between the original 
a very workmanlike studio copy and something that is a little bit further removed um, that the, the whole stroke becomes tentative and decorative. This is the Frick collection, the, the original painting. And the, the actual fleece is painted so freely, and yet there is a logic to its form and a complete command of the materials. Uh, look how the lacing that fastens together the jerkin um, is, is created with these almost liquid lines of brown paint um, that Velasquez controls. But I'll be repeating this throughout this talk that um, there is a sense of urgency to the application of the paint. And if you keep in mind that he was painting this with a very particular date in mind. The three hands. What I find curious is I explained to you before that this shape is due to the entire hand being changed and overlapping onto this color below. Curiously, though this does not overlap onto this, the change was obviously very early on visible and was simply copied visually by the artist. This is the Dulwich Picture Gallery, and I don't need to tell you that this looks like a, a rubber glove. It's uh, not a not an appealing piece of painting. There is strong evidence that the original dimensions of this picture have been changed. They're not so, it's not so clear to see on the surface of the painting. Um, but in X-radiograph, um, it becomes much more evident. What you're seeing marked in red on the X-radiograph are the position of the original strainer bars on which the canvas was first stretched. You see them here, here, here. The center strainer bar here. They're missing at the bottom. If we look at the X-ray and measure these, the distance between the top, top strainer bar and the center strainer bar from here to there, and then do the same in the lower half, clearly there seems to be something missing. If we look at the painting, sorry, I just got to go back. If we look at the painting, there seems to be at least several centimeters missing at the bottom. So what could be missing? Looking at the copy in London, um, I was struck, of course, by the king's lace-covered boots, the top of his boots. And that is what appears to have been trimmed away. And if I do a very crude, I admit, very crude cut and paste, you can imagine this is probably originally um, the type of composition we would have seen. Why was it cut away? We don't know. But it's most likely that it was simply something as prosaic as to fit a frame. And to cut the same amount away above would be impossible. To cut it halfway through here would be probably visually confusing. And so they just removed this whole feature. As I said earlier, one of the pleasures of working on a painting is uh, this privileged intimacy of, of seeing a picture every day, of becoming very familiar with its technique. And so in this painting, I want to share with you some of those details I was able to look at. The painting essentially is in really marvelous condition. It has been lined, that is a, another canvas at some point in its history was glued, adhered to the reverse. But um, generally speaking, it hasn't suffered too much. Definitely uh, some of the paint marks, the paint brush strokes, have been somewhat flattened during the lining process. 
If we look at this same detail in infrared, I think you, you almost sense the brushwork that is perhaps now a little suppressed. Uh, a detail here from the neck, and you can see the gray ground that is used over the entire surface of the canvas that the, the artist applied in preparation for painting. It's quite a sort of dark, warm gray, rather typical of, of the artist around this, uh, the 1640s. And just by leaving this tiny little gap, he creates a wonderful juncture, a wonderful uh, step between the collar and the skin tones. A great deal of the modeling is very thin and fluid. You see here around the eye, this, this veil-like black used here and brown up here. And then throughout these, these very gingery, we'd say in English, um, reddish, uh, orangey reddish touches just brushed in to suggest, I think, the, the complexion and coloring of the king. They're used throughout very, very uh, deftly, very subtly. Um, you see here again, pulled up quite freely across the eye, across the top of the lid, um, Philip's wonderful droopy right eye created there with just a brush stroke. And again, tiny little sliver of the gray ground is left uncovered, creating the, the, the depth and fold of the eyelid. An incredible facility, a, a, an amazing control that is, is um, calculated in the sense that um, there is an awareness, but it's not labored. It, it comes of an amazing ability to, to move and, uh, and manipulate paint. Again, the lips, very, very thin. Again, this reddish tone. In detail, the form almost disappears. In, uh, it, it only works at a, at a distance. And here in the hairline, again, those little red strokes, again, picking up this, this complexion of, 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 the, of the monarch. The gray you see in, used throughout the uh, wonderful crimson overgarment is not the gray of the ground. It is not the gray of the preparatory layer. It's actually a, an additional layer. Um, from this detail here, this is the gray of the ground. This is the preparation. And then the gray around it is an additional layer. And a great deal of this modeling, this modeling that creates a very rich silver embroidery, um, is done wet in wet. The, what the king is wearing was recorded in great detail because he wore it when he paraded before the troops in, I think it was the May of 1644. And so it was very important to record it. But it's recorded with an incredible brio and freedom. There is no um, definite sequence of, of an application of one color and then the next. It's a visual response to uh, what the artist is seeing and, and, a, and a way of recording it. Um, when I looked at the copy in London, that had a very sequential way of painting. It was the gray background of the coat. It was the, f the shape of one of these decorations then the next step, then the next step. In, in the real painting, uh, this is much more fluid, much more organic. Here is the, um, I think it's a velvet trim on the epaulette, but you can see how it's pulled and dragged in uh, partially wet and wet, partially over burly dry paint, as in here. And in the sleeve, this brown translucent color I was talking about, 
I wouldn't call it a glaze in the strict sense of, of say, um, 16th century Netherlandish painting, um, but Velázquez uses, uh, has an incredible ability to use um, thick and thin paint, opaque and translucent and transparent paint, uh, working with them simultaneously uh, to create effects. And so this, this fluid brown creates the, the, the um, translucent shadow of this um, satin material. Um, a beautiful detail of these thick, I would say in English, like jammy, uh, like confiture, uh, red lake uh, dabs that are put on uh, as uh, creating this wonderful embroidery. And uh, my favorite detail of, uh, of all, um, whenever I see this paint, uh, this, this detail, it reminds me of the sort of 1950s New York school paintings in its sort of almost a, a celebration of, of just the application of paint, of the substance of paint itself. And yet it serves, it surrenders itself to form. It, it serves um, the purpose of, of creating this very elaborate um, costume. And I was struck as I always am uh, when I was going around the galleries, when you think of a generation of early, uh, earlier and Juan Pantoja de la Cruz and so on, where you can count the stitches. Um, this is not so much later, and yet um, Philip IV embraced this incredible um, abbreviation of, um, of, of detail and form, and, uh, and clearly recognized the, the, the genius. It, uh, it is a truly magnificent painting. Um, and I think one of the things that is interesting in, in this particular story is how, in, in looking at the picture closely, um, the theories that Pablo, uh, Pablo Perez Dors had about the timing and the, uh, of, of the portrait and the need for it to be back in Madrid at a certain time, you sense it in the picture, you sense the urgency. Uh, Professor Jonathan Brown, when he saw the painting in our studio in detail, said that even for, for Velasquez, this is audacious. But I, I, I think knowing both the, um, why the picture was painted, the uh, conditions it was painted under, and then seeing how, in a sense, despite that, um, Velasquez by far exceeded the challenge to create something really extraordinary. The next painting, it's a very different painting. It's a very different story. This portrait of a man entered the collection of the Metropolitan Museum in 1949. It had been, it entered the, the, the collection as a portrait by Velasquez. It had been acquired by a very important collector, Beach, and um, it was given in good faith as Velázquez. It had been, in a sense, rediscovered in the 1920s by a Hispanist, August Mayer. And he wrote a really beautiful account of the qualities of the painting um, in, I think, 1924, when the picture was cleaned. However, the painting was in the hands of Joseph Devine, the dealer, and it was restored in a way that denied, in a sense, the essence of what the picture was. It had never been, uh, after 1949, when it came into the Met, it was not cleaned again. Um, over the years, uh, varnishes were applied. Uh, when, whenever it went dull, another varnish was put on, but never cleaned. And by 2009, it looked very sad. Um, you can see here in the before cleaning this very um, gloomy, foggy appearance, very hard to read uh, any of the forms in the doublet. Nevertheless, it had a quality. Oh, and something about that intrigued uh, our head of European paintings, our head curator, Keith Christensen, he uh, 
when I first started at the Metropolitan Museum, he asked me about working on it. He said it had intrigued him. He didn't for one second think it was by Velazquez. He just felt there was something there that was more than just some tired workshop copy. Um, a few years went by, and then I worked on the uh, Frick's painting. And we thought it was a good time to uh, bring the picture up to the studio to examine it. It was obvious that aside from a very discolored varnish, there was a great deal of toning on it, toning that had been put on in the 1925 restoration. And I was somewhat hesitant. I wasn't sure uh, what I might find beneath all this. But it, it was clear the picture was looking, um, as I say, sad, forgotten. Um, I did a little cleaning test, uh, which I, I'm afraid I don't have a slide of, but I did a little cleaning test down in the bottom. And suddenly this very rich black emerged, quite free, and it didn't look like an abraded paint layer, it just looked like a very free, sketchy paint layer. So I, with that in mind, I agreed to pursue with the cleaning. This is the painting after cleaning. Um, what you see is the painting with very little varnish on. Uh, a painting of this period requires a saturating varnish for the color and tone to read properly. Um, the, the problems you see are a few, not many, little damages here and here, down here. And then an area where the artist made a significant change in the hair, which was then at a later date, misunderstood, and someone overcleaned in these areas. But what had happened in the previous restoration was everything was quietened down. They, they had turned this sketch, this life sketch, into an old master portrait. And they had done that, if I'm cynical, entirely for the market it would sell better as, this is what an old master looks like. So um, this is the painting after restoration. Basically, the biggest change you're seeing in the blacks is purely um, the application of varnish. There is no retouching in that area. It just saturates more. And suddenly, it, it, it felt very true to itself, a spirited sketch from life, probably not meant to be given to anyone, certainly not a finished commissioned portrait. The painting was created, first of all, it's on a, it's on a, a gray pink ground, that's the preparatory layer over the entire canvas. You can see it a little at the edges. On this, the artist created a brush sketch, brush line sketch, and you can just see a little bit of it that has been canceled out by the overlying layer, but that's it there, and it goes up and around. In these other paintings by Velazquez, this is still in evidence. Here it's used to suggest a sculpture, but here it's unfinished. And that is you know, exactly what we're seeing there. From that, Brush drawing, um, the, the uh, artist then began to model the, the forms with a fairly free application of a blackish brown paint. Uh, you see it here, and more or less here. That would have been the entire portrait. And then gradually on top of that, he used more opaque color. In the doublet, in the jacket he wears, uh, a, a sort of paler gray, uh, more opaque gray is pulled across these areas to give it form. But, but it's still just a suggestion. It's not taken to a high finish. The collar, um, I, 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 I believe it's called a gorilla, um, is beautifully painted. It's just a th three or four strokes of color pulled round. And yet, if I just go back, it sits perfectly in space. The whole sense of its slight transparency, its, it, the, the, its rigidity um, is effortlessly created. And though the costume is, is 
handled with this freedom um, in this cursory manner, the head has a searing intensity and focus. He uses opaque pale color over this um, undermodeling, this, this monochrome undermodeling, to begin to create the, the flesh tones. Um, here it's pulled down more thinly, and so you get the sense of the, of, of the, of the, of the beard, as it were. Um, I said to everyone, this has become my favorite mustache in the whole of art history, uh, just so freely, effortlessly painted, and the way it moves around the corner of his face here. And then more thickly fluid applications of pinks and white paints that suggest almost a sort of moist skin. It feels like a living skin, the way the, the vein just travels up the side of the forehead. And yet, it, I think everyone can sense that this was painted with intensity, but nothing labored, and probably in a, I wouldn't say quickly, but um, not over many, many weeks, clearly. So who is the man? Um, it was known for many years that this portrait was strongly associated with uh, Velazquez's magnificent surrender of Breda, and in particular, the gentleman here. Um, I think everyone agrees that this is the same man. Um, over time, it had been suggested that this could be a, it's a typical position for an artist right at the periphery. Um, the figure is, is almost separated from the action by this enormous horse. He looks very directly at you, and so does this character, but I always find when I'm in front of this painting that this figure feels to me to have a different engagement. Below this, which is cropped on this picture, is the blank cartolino where the artist might have put his name. So there he is. I think um, given that the, 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 this change in scale, the, the addition of costume, I think it's, it's not difficult to see that this is the same man. So could that man be this man? Um, several years later, several kilos heavier. Um, I can't resist putting them together and I can't resist doing that. Um, and what I would draw your attention to, um, I'm, I'm allowed to do this, I'm up here, um, is, is this brow bone, which I find very, very distinctive, this very heavy bone structure. The fact is, we'll probably never know. There is one very interesting, I mean, for example, uh, Professor Jonathan Brown, who knows infinitely more about Velasquez and the Habsburg court than I could ever hope to. He feels that the, the hierarchy of the Habsburg court would rule out the possibility of Velasquez inserting himself into such an important historical um, record as the surrender of Breda. I wonder whether the intimacy of 10 years of painting the king and his family slightly blurs that hierarchy and might allow him to take that step. In a certain way, we may not know, at when Velasquez died in his post-mortem inventory is listed a self-portrait with the clothes unfinished. I wonder whether, could that be this picture? We won't know, um, but I will say that the, the months this picture sat on my easel here in the studio of the Metropolitan will, will continue to remain something very, very special to me. My final story, as it were, is, is probably the most complicated. Um, since we were on a roll, um, as we say in English, since we were, I'd worked on the Fraga Philip, I'd worked on the portrait of a man, um, 
Keith Christiansen was very keen for me to look at this painting from the collection. Um, the main reason being it, it was it looked in terrible state. I, it looks much better in this image, um, digitized, projected, than it did in real life. Um, and we knew that the condition was very compromised. We also knew that it had never been treated, that it had entered the collection in 1911, never been treated since. It, actually let me go back. It is known uh, through um, Pacheco, uh, Velázquez's father-in-law and biographer, that um, Velázquez won his position at court um, in 1623 uh, by creating a portrait of the king that astounded everyone in its likeness. There has been a great deal of debate in art historical literature of whether that portrait that won him his position was a, a full-length portrait, was a bust, just length portrait, was a finished painting, was a sketch. This picture is certainly not that um, painting. In fact, we know an enormous amount about the commission of this picture. Um, it was, uh, it came to the Metropolitan Museum, as I say, in 1911, and it came along with this signed receipt. Um, Velázquez was commissioned in 1624 to paint three paintings. He was commissioned um, by uh, Don García Araciel. I think I'm, I'm going to, I hope my pronunciation will get you through that. He was a, a magistrate of, of Castile, and he, uh, we think it was he who commissioned it, we're not sure. But certainly the commission was for three portraits, one of the king, one of Count Duke of Olivares, and one of Araciel himself. On December 4th, 1624, this lady, who was by then the widow of Araciel, Araciel died in September 24, she paid Velázquez 800 reales, and this is Velázquez signing a receipt of payment for that amount for the three portraits. The portrait of Araciel is lost, and I, I should just say this is a later portrait that Velázquez did some years later that is now here in the Prado of the widow after she remarried. But the other portrait in this commission of three is uh, now in Sao Paulo, Brazil, um, of the Count Duke of Olivares. In a sense, despite the weaknesses, both in the metropolitan picture and in this painting, they have an extraordinary provenance. Um, normally, art historians dream of finding a signed receipt of payment. Um, but what had happened was the, the painting had just slipped inexorably into workshop status, to the point it was no longer really discussed, um, the Metropolitan painting. It was known that it had strong associations with the very famous portrait of the king here in the Prado. This picture of Philip is thought to have been reworked in about 1628. However, it was already recognized that it had a strong association with the image depicted in the Metropolitan Museum's painting. Over time, paint becomes more transparent, and if something has been covered over, it often starts to reassert itself, to show itself again. And so these shadows of a previous composition began to emerge over time, and people could see that there was some connection with this other portrait. When the painting was finally x-rayed in the 20th century, uh, it became obvious that the portrait underneath was very closely associated with the image depicted in the Metropolitan's painting. So you see the different position of the legs, the change in the hand from 
um, an open bill to a single bill, the raise of the hand, the raise, the change in the height of the table, etc. Sorry, yes. The situation is further complicated. We know of the version in the Prado, even if it is only through X ray, that there is an earlier version, probably from 1623. We don't know if that is the painting that secured Velasquez his position at court. Why would it be overpainted if it had? But we know that beneath it is this painting. We know the Metropolitan Museum's picture, the picture that came, painted definitely from a commission in 1624, paid for in December of that year. Um, then in uh, the Meadows Museum in Dallas, in Texas, is this bust length portrait of Philip. And these, I, I tried to lay these paintings out more or less to scale. So um, this picture hasn't been cropped. It was always these dimensions. It's very damaged around the edges, but it has in the literature been suggested that this could be the portrait that won Velasquez his position at court. To my mind, it is, it is too weak for that. To, um, too tame, but it has been suggested. And then there is this painting in Boston, which generally speaking has been accepted at wo as workshop. But as you can see, it's a complicated array. There's also, to my knowledge, a very, very damaged version of this picture in the um, storerooms of the Louvre, in the depot of the Louvre. The problem with the Metropolitan Museum's painting was it, it is extremely damaged. And it was known to be damaged and to be extensively overpainted. As I said, it, it was acquired um, in 1914. I think I said 1911 before. It acquired in 1914. And it had been treated once again whilst in the possession of the dealer Joseph Devine. And not unlike the portrait of a man, the, the treatment was generous in its application of overpaint. We knew from the x-ray that this was a very damaged picture. Um, the problem being is that x-ray tends to only reveal damage to paint that, that is x-ray opaque. So any paint like lead white that blocks the penetration of x-ray will be revealed. Of course, this picture is predominantly blacks, and that is not, damage to blacks is not revealed in x-ray. When I did a test cleat, I was really shocked at the level of damage because the blacks had been so brutally cleaned at some point in the picture's history. The other big issue was from the x-ray, it was clear that the entire eye was missing. Despite those reservations, um, the decision was made to proceed. And I should emphasize at this point that um, when someone like myself talks to an audience, it can very much sound like I'm the only person who works at the Metropolitan Museum. All of this work is done, relies on the very close collaboration with curatorial colleagues, with my colleagues in the conservation department and my colleagues in the Department of Scientific Research. The decision to proceed with the cleaning was very much one that I took with uh, our chief curator, Keith Christensen. And the reason he, in a sense, persuaded me to go ahead was when he realized the extent of the overpainting, he said, I can't hang this picture again. Now I know how, what a fiction it is. Um, it isn't one thing or other. It isn't, it isn't even Velasquez workshop because it's, it's not got anything, you, there's no, part of the painting that doesn't have somebody's paint on top of it. So I decided to proceed. Um, 
cleaning a very damaged pitcher is not a, a pleasant thing. Um, it, it's, uh, the, 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 you have a real sense of the responsibility ahead. But there were qualities to this picture that really seemed worth revealing. So you see the painting in course of cleaning. Um, it's undersaturated, there's very little varnish on it, um, so it looks dry. Um, at some point in the pitcher's history, at least prior to 1905, these additions were put on. They're not original, but they're, they're old. Just to give you a sense of the overpainting, you can't see the additions because this color was over the entire background. And though the background is compromised, it, has, it speaks much more of, of, of the period and of, of the artist. This is the painting after cleaning and filling. So um, all of the varnish and whatever I could safely remove of overpaint was removed, and it's a little undersaturated. There isn't much varnish, but um, and the losses in the uh, if I just go back, the losses in the paint film have been filled in a color that mimics uh, the reddish ground. If but one of obviously the big issues was the head. Um, it's very difficult to, to recreate an eye. We are so incredibly attuned to the human face that um, to sort of invent something is almost impossible to get a happy result. However, we knew of the Meadows portrait in, in uh, sorry, the, 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 yes, the, the portrait in the Meadows collection in, in Texas. And so I asked, and, and clearly there is an unbelievably strong resemblance. I requested a very high quality digital image from the Meadows, which they kindly supplied. And then out of curiosity, I also requested a tracing that they take a sheet of plastic and just draw the outlines. What was startling was the tracing matched exactly the features of the Metropolitan's painting. This allowed me to place the feature of the eye very well. So I just want to take you through a sequence to explain that this is, again, after cleaning, uh, this material you see is the filling that matches the red ground uh, a little lighter. This is the start of the retouching. So um, these colors are painted back to become less dominant. Uh, the, begin the reconstruction of the eye. And already what happens when you do that is the existing original begins to push forward. When you look at this picture, you, all you see is damage. When you go to here, you begin to see the painting again. And so that means that the next phase of the retouching is much easier to achieve uh, because you're guided by the actual original paint. And so this is the same sequence of the whole painting with the underpainting. And the big change you see there in the blacks is simply, again, the action of the varnish saturating. And so suddenly, with the damage suppressed, the picture doesn't look a ruin. It looks compromised, but it looks like uh, there is something to pull out that is not an invention. And that's the painting after restoration. Um, so th the whole process of finding the, the tracing of the Meadows portrait matched so exactly with our portrait made me very curious. The, the X-ray, this is obviously, as it says, this is the Meadows portrait, detail of the portrait that is upstairs here at the Prado. And this is the X-radiograph of this picture. And 
basically an x-radiograph shows all layers simultaneously. So what you're getting here is a combination of these two. That's why you get this strange double chin, this slightly bloated, ugly appearance. It was, it was misunderstood in, in, in a lot of the literature. Um, people hypothesized that the painting was overpainted because Philip thought he had been, it was too, too real a likeness of the ugly king. It's not this at all. We're, we're looking at two pictures superimposed. In um, January of 2010, uh, myself and curatorial colleagues uh, came to Madrid, and our very kind and always gracious colleagues here at the Prado allowed us to examine the x-ray of um, the Philip from upstairs. And I laid a tracing over the x-ray, and I hope you can see this is the actual physical tracing, how it matches exactly the position of the first head. So what of the picture as a whole? I brought a tracing also, not only of the Meadows head, but also of the entire Metropolitan Museum figure. And I've, for clarity, I've, made, I've done this digitally, so it's, it's very clear. The match was very good, but not perfect. However, what you have to remember is any tracing was, was in the 17th century was not done with a, a continuous sheet of plastic. It was done with pieces of paper. And so it's misleading to take one whole image and expect it to match hand to ear to foot. If we instead, just arbitrarily with that digital tracing, chop it into pieces, and lay it on like that, suddenly you can achieve an almost perfect match. So clearly the, the, there's no question that a tracing was used in these paintings. So what of the Boston picture? Was the Boston picture a replica? Was it a workshop copy? We, we, after cleaning, after restoration, after, we, with all the art historical information we had on the Metropolitan's picture, we were convinced that it was an autograph replica, not a workshop copy. Um, Boston very kindly agreed to allow their painting to come to our studio for comparison. And it was a very eerie, and fascinating experience to have these two pictures side by side. It used to be very interesting to watch visitors come in and do a sort of double take. Well, the match was even more exact. This is the tracing of the Metropolitan Museum portrait, and this is just laid directly. I haven't even cut this into segments. This is just laid directly on the picture and it's more than a 90% match. It looks like I've traced the picture. So exact, is it? So obviously the next question was, did the Meadows portrait fit? Yes, um, and very, very strongly. The question of the two portraits then was what was their relationship? Um, there was no doubt that there was a connection because of this, um, the way the tracings worked. But seeing the pictures side by side was really something of a revelation because in illustration, um, the, the likenesses seem pretty close. When you put the pictures side by side, the weaknesses of the Boston picture really spoke very strongly. Um, when the Boston curators came to see the picture together, they walked into the room and said, okay, you win. Um, the Boston painting, for me, Philip looks 10 years older. He looks mean-spirited. There's something hard in the treatment. 
In the X radiographs, there are strong similarities. The, the application is very typical of the workshop, of the studio, um, the, 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 the reinforcement lines around the figure, uh, around the contours, and so on. Um, the costume is actually painted with a degree of freedom in the Boston picture. But the heads, I think, are, are the most revealing. Um, the Boston painting, everything seems labored. The brush marks follow the form, and yet there is, it lacks the visual intelligence that is evident, I believe, in the Metropolitan Museum's painting. It seemed to us to illustrate in one juxtaposition the difference between autograph replica and workshop copy. Nevertheless, the comparisons were really compelling because I think in an age now of easy reproduction, where we are used to seeing, with the touch of a button, we can replicate something, we, we should never lose sight of how difficult it is to replicate to this degree. For example, the, the three paint strokes used to create the edge of the paper are mimicked exactly. This can't be done from an engraving or a drawing. This requires side-by-side -side comparison. And the, the sort of, maybe not a big eureka moment, but suddenly we thought, what are we thinking? Why are we thinking about the picture that is under the Prado's portrait? The Boston picture is quite simply a copy of the Metropolitan Museum's picture. And the one thing that was staring us in the face was, of course, only these pictures have the gold chain. They're both, this is absent from both the Prado X-ray and from the um, Meadows Museum portrait bust. The whole question of repetition, the whole question of um, the, the role of an artist who has to update the, the, the king's likeness, who has to provide likenesses of the king to varying levels of officials, suddenly became very tangible. And I purposely don't uh, title these because the, the, the process is not an easy one. And also, I think when you don't, you're not comparing things side by side, it's much more difficult. Replication was clearly something that Velazquez learned early on. These uh, paintings from uh, uh, that when he was in Seville um, very early in his career. It's also something that we know, the use of, of, of um, cartoons, uh, we know in other artists, Van Dyck, um, uh, Gentileschi, it's, um, the replication, I think, was something maybe they took for granted more than we will ever know. Um, the whole idea of the status of objects, I think, comes into question. We must always um, question our own assumptions about first, second, third, in terms of giving gold, silver, and bronze. The, uh, the artists were pragmatic in, the, in, in their role. I hope that the restoration of this picture, in a sense, has, has given back dignity to a picture that suffered much indignity. Um, the, the great Hispanist and, and biographer of, of Velazquez, uh, Lopez Rey, when the Metropolitan Museum demoted this picture in 1977, he wrote a very strong criticism of the museum, of the Metropolitan Museum, the following month. Um, stoutly defending this picture, saying that the Metropolitan had ignored the, the documentary evidence of a signed receipt and so on. And I, I will paraphrase, uh, but he, he very movingly says he doesn't believe it is any better to take a work away from an artist than to wrongly attribute 
to, to an artist because he said it denies a reality. And it feels to me that we, we did not discover something here. We just, I think, got the balance back that what many art historians had said for many generations was this is an autograph replica. It doesn't have the spark of an original work, but it has the qualities that we associate or many of the qualities we associate with the artist himself. It was really an enormous pleasure for me over the last few years to work on these three paintings. And I think what is fascinating in the idea of in search of an author is the great pleasure of great paintings is that they are richer and more complicated than we can ever imagine. And whatever questions we put to them, the answers are always more complicated. And in the end, they always have more interesting questions for us to go back to and revisit. Thank you.